Okay, keep your place in 2 Kings. We're going to get there eventually, but what we're going to do this morning, turn your Bibles to, put a bookmark in 2 Kings 23, and I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, in the New Testament. So, we're continuing our, our series this morning on the axis of evil, and of course what we're talking about, we talked about the public school system last week, we're going to talk about media this morning, and then next week we're going to talk about um, liberal Christianity. These are three things that I've identified and I've thought about for years that have destroyed um, you know, biblical Christianity in this country. There are three things that I can basically say, I think wrap, those three things wrap up the majority of the problems that we have in this country. And this morning we're going to talk about media and TV inside the walls of your home. Now, men especially, we're out in the world and we're working in the world every, every day, every week. Um, there's nothing that we can do about that. We need to learn to deal with that. Um, that's a sermon in itself, being out in the world and learning to deal with that in the proper way. You're going to be with unsaved people out there. And it's going to, you know, you shouldn't be in an overtly vulgar situation. I have met Christian men who were working in places that were just, just bad to the core. And those types of situations are, are not uh, navigable. You should get out. But there are ways to conduct yourself in the world and, you know, in an environment where you can keep your integrity. Um, but what we're talking about um, this morning is things that you can have complete control over. And that's inside the walls of your home. What you let inside your home. And if you look at 2 Peter in chapter 2, look it down at verse number 6. And the Bible says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, meaning he was saved, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now, the Bible says that Lot, and you can see it throughout the story of Lot and Lot's family, how his daughters were, how his sons-in-laws didn't even believe him. And, you know, his family suffered greatly by being in that environment that he was in, and it changed, it changed him. So I need you to pay attention today. Um, I, had this, I had this sermon idea in my head for a long time, and when I was thinking about this sermon for the last several months or whatever, I had statistics and things in my mind that I remembered from 10 years ago. And when I went and I looked at things um, this week and over the last few days, it, it, just, it really jumped out at me that things have gotten much worse than I remember them being. Okay? Now, inside the walls of your home, there's a story... Um, in mythology, I think most people think that this story is actually based on a historical event, but there's a story about, it's in the 11th or 12th century BC, about the Greeks that were waging a battle against this city called Troy. And they waged this battle for 10 years. They besieged this city and they couldn't breach the walls of this city. So what they ended up doing, and you maybe have heard the story, is they built a, a large wooden horse and they withdrew their forces, but what they did was they packed some of their elite soldiers inside this horse, and the people of Troy, they opened the gates of their city when they saw that the massive army and the siege was apparently over, and they brought this horse inside the walls of their city. The men then came out of the horse and they burned the entire city of Troy. And I think most people think that, about 80% of historians, I believe, think that this story was actually something that happened. But even if it didn't, it's a good analogy um, for what we need to get at today. Turn to Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Right in the center of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalm. Go to Psalm 101. Psalm 101. And the Bible says in Psalm 101, in verse number 3, the Bible says this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, we may have heard this verse several times, but there's a couple things that I want to point out to you. And the first thing I want to point out to you is the two words that say, I hate. That's an extreme statement. I hate. The psalmist is saying that, yes, I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes, but not only that, I hate the work 
of them that turn aside. And then I want you to highlight or underline these three words at the end of that verse. It shall not cleave to me. Now that implies that if you don't hate these things and you don't hate and you put wicked things before your eyes and you don't hate these things, that it will cleave to you. That it, will, that it will attach itself to you. That it will cleave to your family. Now I want to show you some things this morning that I hope, I hope I hit a lot of you straight in the gut this morning because it's very, very serious. These things will cleave to you, they will change you. The media influences inside our house today is Satan's Trojan horse. And if you see the numbers that I'm going to show you this morning, you're going to see that it's very successful. The Christian home is burning today. It's on fire. It's on fire, my friends. So you've got these walls. And you have control of these walls. You know, unlike the world outside, you have to go to work, men. You have to go out in the world, and you have to find a way to operate in this world and, and keep, your, keep your Christian standards. But you, you can make the rules in your home. And you can control this. But it's not going to be an accident. Okay? The first thing I want to do this morning is I want to give you some problem statements. We're going to look at two main things this morning. There's not enough time to look at everything. We're going to look at two main things. First of all, we're going to look at TV and TV programming. And then we're going to look at the internet. Those are the two things that we're going to look at. Those two things, especially the internet, could be a sermon series by themselves. I'm not going to be able to get into everything, so I'm going to focus on the main problems. I want to give you problem statements, and if you think that I'm just preaching through this sermon and I'm just giving you problems after problem after problem, we'll get to solutions at the end. Okay? So just, just hang in there. Now, let's talk about TV first. Turn to Romans chapter 7. I want to talk about the influence of TV and TV programming inside your home. Okay? Romans chapter 7. Let me give you some t statistics. And these have gotten worse as well from the last time I looked at these types of things. Um, the average American watches five and a half hours of TV a day, and this is consistent across adults to kids. I can't even fathom that. I don't even know where. I, I believe it, though, because I do work with people. I work with people, and that's all they do. They just go home and watch TV. It's pitiful. It, it's pitiful. That, that's the best thing you can say about it. It's just pitiful. The average retired baby boomer watches over seven hours of TV a day. I didn't used to believe this until I saw, um, I've, I've witnessed a dozen or more people uh, retire over the last 10 years of my life, and it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And here's the funny thing about retirement. I don't want to go off on a, on a rabbit trail here, but here's the funny thing about the retirement idea in America today. You basically... You basically work, uh, you know, you're going to retire so you can play golf and go on vacation. But here's what actually happens. You get sick of golf because you can't golf every single day for 12 hours a day. That gets, that gets old. You get sick of golf and you really only go on vacation for a couple, three, four, five, six weeks a year maybe if you really like to go on vacation. So what they're really doing is they're sitting around watching TV. And I've seen this demonstrated again and again and again to me. I've actually seen men come back to work because they're bored with retirement. You know, there's a saying, ships and men rust at port. It's true. You know, it's not in the Bible, but that's very true. Right? Now, think about this for a minute. When you heard these, these statistics, five hours, five and a half hours a day, and then retired people, seven hours a day. Think about how stupid this is. You basically have dual income families in this country. You have to be dual income so you can stack up all this money. Right? And because you're dual income, you're, the TV raises your kids, you bring your kids home from daycare or wherever and you put them in front of the TV, they're watching five hours, five and a half hours of TV a day outside of school. So the TV's raising your kids. And you do this so you can stack up money and then you can retire so you can watch TV all day. That's the average American. That's what's happening. I mean, define insanity. That's crazy. But that's exactly what's happening. You say, that's not me. Well, great, but that's the vast majority of everybody out there. All right? God forbid it's anybody in this room that that happens to. That's why we're preaching sermons like this. All right, are you in Romans 7? 
Romans 7 and verse 13. I want to throw out a theory that, it's not a theory, it's, it's what the Bible teaches, but you need to understand this. In Romans 7 and 13, the Bible says this, Was then that which, which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Romans 7 is just delving into the law and talking about the law and the purpose of the law. I don't want to give away Romans 7 uh, sermon that we're going to have in a few weeks, but he's talking about the law. Was then that which is, made, is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. Now right here, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Now this is the way it works according to the Bible, folks. The more you are exposed to the law, to the Bible, to the church, to people in the church, to your brothers and sisters in Christ that are sharpening you, the more sin will pop out at you. It will just stand out like, like a, it'll stick out like a sore thumb. On the other hand, on the flip side of that coin, is the more you are exposed to the world, to sin, to people in sin, the more sin will blend in. It's called desensitization. Secular studies show it. Secular studies again and again and again show that people become desensitized to X. Enter sin here. That's exactly the way it works. The Bible says Lot was vexed. He was exposed to sin constantly. Look at how his daughters turned out. They were wicked. Look at how he was. He apparently you know, wasn't against drinking. His sons-in-law had no respect for him. They wouldn't listen to him. They died in, in, in the fire. So here's the irony. As TV desensitizes you to sin, what's actually happening is the TV programming that people are watching during these several hours a day, it's programming them. That's exactly what's happening. I want to give you some examples of sins and how TV is programming people to not pay attention to these sins anymore. I believe this is a major portion of what's wrong with this country. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3, I'm just going to read it for you. The Bible says this, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Fornication. Having intimate relations with the opposite sex before you're married. Okay? And I'm, you know, we're going to talk about some uncomfortable things this morning. I don't really like talking about these things. I don't like reading about these things. But we have to talk about these things because they're, they're what's destroying our, our country and what are going to, could very possibly destroy your home. So we need to talk about these things. Secular studies that I mentioned. Studies have shown that teens who watch sexual content on TV are more likely to initiate sexual activity or participate in other sexual activities earlier than peers who don't watch sexually explicit shows. I mean, this isn't rocket surgery. Fornication is normalized on TV. So not only are they exposed to it like we talked last week at eight hours of school every day, but they come home and they're exposed to more of it when they're watching TV. And here's the, here's the thing. There's no consequences on TV. A TV show that I'm going to use as an example is a TV show that was, when I was in my 20s, that was very popular. And I don't know what shows there are now, but I'm sure they're worse. Seinfeld was a show that I, I watched when I was in my 20s. Now, I went and I looked up the stats on this. Jerry Seinfeld had 66 different girlfriends throughout the entire series of that show. 66, all of which fornication was happening. It was at least implied. The other female character on the show, you say, oh, it's just the guys. The female character on the show, the main character, had 56 different boyfriends on the show. And no consequences, right? The show is they're, they're in nice restaurants, they're having fun, they're at the gym, it's all this kind of thing, okay? In real life, and I'm not going to get in depth on this because you know we're going to keep this as G-rated as possible, but here's the brass tacks of it, basically, from everything that I read. According to the CDC, a government website, about half the people in the United States will get a sexually transmitted, transmitted disease. About half. So every time you go out and commit fornication, you can basically say you're flipping a coin. 
Okay? Now here's the thing about a coin flip. That first coin flip, you got a 50-50 shot. But if you flip a coin twice, the odds that you're going to get out unscathed is 0.5 times 0.5. And so your odds of getting out unscathed go exponentially down. If you flip that coin four times, the odds that it will come up in your favor four times in a row is about 6%. So, 66 different girlfriends? I mean, the reality of that TV show is if that was really true and that was a case that was happening in real life, those people would have spent their time in the doctor's office and, you know, just in horrible depression, probably. Because they would have destroyed their bodies, they would have destroyed their lives. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Many of these things can't be cured. They cause cancer in women. They cause women to not be able to have children. I mean, these are lifelong consequences that these things have. You don't hear about that on the funny comedy shows. It's the exact opposite, folks, of what the Bible teaches. In 1 Corinthians 6, in verse number 18, the Bible says this, flee fornication. It doesn't say don't do it. It says just get as far away from it as you can. And it says every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. When you see these statistics, doesn't it make a little bit of sense? You're sinning against your own body. You're destroying your own body. It, it's, it's terrible. I mean, how would you like to have the conversation, single young men, with your future wife? Um, I'm sorry, um, I, we're going to get married, but I want you to know that if you marry me, you're going to have this disease for the rest of your life. That's, that comes with the package of marrying me. Can you imagine having that conversation? How many people must have to have that conversation? A lot of people. You see, folks, it's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. It's just like last week. It's just like last week. It's not like they're teaching something that's a little bit different in certain areas. It's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. There are serious consequences. The law, as we talked about Thursday night, the law is freedom. Life without some, one of these sick diseases is freedom. Having a great marriage is freedom. That's what you need to strive for. The law is there to protect you. God loves us. That's why he gave us this law. It's not all these rules to make your life miserable. It's freedom. It's protection for us. So that's just one thing. Let's look at unnatural behavior. Unnatural people. The world you see on TV is a lie. Amen. The whole thing. Right. Unnatural beha behavior. Example. Now, the only polls I can find on public opinion talk about gay marriage. I don't believe in gay marriage. You can say that you're an elephant. It doesn't make you an elephant. Gay marriage doesn't exist. It doesn't matter how many people believe in gay marriage. It's never going to exist. Marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the way God defined it. God defined marriage. Okay? So I'm just going to give you some examples of public opinion polls so you can see the influence that's happening here. So there's my disclaimer. According to a Gallup support poll, or according to Gallup polling, support for gay marriage was 27% in 1999. That wasn't that long ago, folks. In 2019, it's 63%. Amongst those under 30, it's 83%. I can't wait until these 30-year-old kids start ruling this country. It's going to be so much fun. Can you imagine? A bunch of sodomite socialists are taking over in about 10 years. So buckle up. It's coming. 83%. In 1977, the amount of people that thought that gays should be allowed to adopt children was 13%. Now it's 75%. So something has happened to change people's mind on this. It's been, there's a paradigm shift here. It's not that long ago. 1999 is not that long ago. 20 years. According to a, a scholar.org study, the beautiful thing about all this stuff is like secular studies just back it all up. It's wonderful. Gordon Allport, an influential, influential psychologist, is often cited in scholarly research for his contact thesis. Okay? 
which simply put says that under the right conditions, interpersonal contact is one of the best ways to reduce prejudice between majority and minority groups. Building on this idea, it is argued that imagined contact or virtual contact, even with characters in a TV show, can change perceptions of outgroups. There you go. That's what's going on. I mean, we had a Bible reason in Romans chapter 7, but even the secular people understand it. Increases in representations of gay people in news, television, movies started in the 1990s, prominently exemplified by Ellen DeGeneres coming out on mainstream American television in her portrayal of Ellen Morgan in the ABC sitcom Ellen. Portrayals of lesbian women and gay men have continued to increase over two decades since they were featured in popular shows like Will and Grace and Modern Family. Here's one for you. 42% of TV programming features a sodomite. 42%. Whoa! That was like one of the things that surprised me. I mean, I knew that they were all over even, you know, when I used to watch TV. 42%. When polled in the United States, the average American thinks that 25% of the population is gay or is homosexual. Where are they getting that from? I don't know, five and a half hours a day? That's where. It's 1%, 2%. And that number is growing too because they're not reproducers, they're recruiters. That number's increasing too, but it's not 25%. But when you have 42% of everything that you're watching featuring these unnatural people, it's programming you. That's it. Turn to Romans chapter one. Yeah, we're going there again. They're creating this virtual contact that is desensitizing Americans to sodomy. It's pitiful. It's disgusting. And they're always these funny, quirky characters. They're funny. Everybody likes them. They're, the most, they're popular. Let's see what the Bible says. Romans chapter 1, in verse number 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even if they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, not natural. Being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Do these sound like funny, quirky people? No. Does it sound like it's a little bit different than what TV is telling you? Amen. It's the opposite. It's the exact opposite. They're molesting children. See the Catholics and the Boy Scouts. Go look it up. They're killing children as they adopt them and drive them off a cliff in California. That happened not that far from right here. It's crazy. I mean, who's sticking up for these kids? That's what I want to know every time I read this stuff. It's pitiful. Americans are literally being brainwashed. I went to somebody's house like two or three months ago to help them fix something on their house. And I was working on their house. And th this was a, a, a Christian home, but they were a little worldly. And they were watching like some people's courts or something. And I was, just, I was just shocked at this family of four people, including the kids that just sat around the TV. They were just like this. Yeah. I mean, there's like flies going in and out of their mouth. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's weird when you've been out of it for a long time and you see it, it pops out at you like that. And it's weird. And what is it? It's some homo suing somebody on, on people's court. Of course. Right? I mean, you, you don't have to make this stuff up. It's, it's real. Let's look at violence. Turn to Psalm 11. Violence. Psalm 11, right in the center of your Bible, book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 11. See what God says about violence. The Bible says in Psalm 11, in verse number 5, is everybody there? I'll wait. 
My wife says I go too fast having everybody turn to things, so I'm, not, I'm trying to change. I'm trying to be better. We'll wait. Psalm chapter 11. I want everyone to see this. Look at verse number 5. Psalm chapter 11, verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. That's extreme. If you love violence, God hates you. I mean, that's hate speech. If you love violence, God hates you. Now here's the thing about the gospel that we were talking about. The gospel, if you don't accept the gospel, it's a heart issue, right? So here's kind of something that I always think about. If you're into all these things of violence and you're into all these other things, look, the gospel, God wrote the law in your heart. If you were, if you were born and you were not exposed to a bunch of garbage and someone preaches the gospel, the gospel is the perfect key to that heart Amen. that's undefiled. Yep. And it will fit perfectly. That's why you'll get to the door and some people will say, yeah, I want to hear. And those people will just accept the whole thing. Because it fits, that key fits right in their heart. But as people are exposed to these things, their, their, their heart is seared. And it's seared. And it's seared. And that key doesn't fit as well. And pretty soon that key won't fit anymore. And that's where you see people that are given over in Romans chapter 1. And the Bible says that if you actually get to the point where you love violence, God hates you. God hates you. What is that going to do for your odds of getting saved? <laughs> You're done. That's what that means. The most, turn to Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at, look at the most tragic and catastrophic event in history. Genesis chapter 6, the very first book in your Bible. And let's look at the reasons that God gives the detailed reason that God gives for the reason that He did this, where He unleashed His wrath on this earth in the worst way that He ever has to date. And let's look at the reason. In Genesis 6, verse 11, the Bible says this, The earth, earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? Violence. Not environmental pollution. Violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupt his way, corrupted his way on the earth. Corrupted his way in what way? Could you give me some more detail, God? And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled, he says it again, with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Video games. 75% of American households have video games. 97% of teens play video games. 85% of these games contain violence. 50% are based entirely on violence. Period. Let me introduce you to someone. Dave Grossman. He's an American author who specializes in the study of the psychology of killing, a discipline which he labels killology. He's a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Army and a former professor of psychology at West Point. He wrote a book called On Killing which is the, psychology cost, the psychological cost of learning to kill in war and society. In it, he reveals evidence that most people have a phobia-level response to violence and that soldiers need to be specifically trained to kill. You see, in World War II, the United States found out that they had a problem. The amount of soldiers that would go into World War II on the American side that would actually shoot at the enemy the first time was about 10% they found that most men were either not shooting or they were missing on purpose. Because you see, we have this law written in our heart, right? And it tells us that we should not want to kill another human being. So they have to be specifically trained to do this. So he wrote two books. One of them is called On Killing and the other is called On Combat. So the United States specifically found a way to train soldiers to where in the Vietnam War that went to almost 100% and there's no more problems getting people to shoot the first time. And what they've done is they had them shoot at silhouettes of men and they had them use simulators that were more real life, not just shooting at round paper targets with a bullseye. They had to train them to be desensitized to this. His book on combat is how you, how you fix this. 
So you've now trained somebody that it's okay to kill somebody else. Now they come back and they're going to go work at Pizza Hut. How do you fix, how do you undo this? This is your post-traumatic stress and all this type of thing, okay? Now look, Dave Grossman says this. He's an expert on this. He says this, from a military and law enforcement perspective, violent video games are murder simulators that train kids to kill. They act just like police and military simu simulators. Do you see that? They're the same thing. Providing condition responses, killing skills, and desensitization, except they are inflicted on children without the discipline of military and police training. Remember last week, the schools, 282,000 assaults a month in public school? It's violence. School shootings? It's not going to get better. Here's a prophecy for you. It's going to get worse. There's going to be more. There's going to be more people that shoot up schools. They, they're, going to, they're going to make all kinds of gun laws and all this kind of stuff, and kids are still going to go and they're going to shoot up schools. And they're going to kill people because they're being trained to kill people. That's the bottom line. They're being desensitized to violence. You want to talk about violence? There's been 54 million abortions in this country. What is the definition of violence? You want to see the definition of violence? I had some classmates of mine when I was in high school and they, were, they were, thought they were feminists or whatever. They're like, oh, we're pro-choice. And my mom was always really involved in the right to life movement. And my mom was a nurse, so she had all kinds of like, medical books that like, explained. You know how they, get the peop they would get people to not want to have an abortion? They basically just show them their baby in an ultrasound. And that pretty much does it. Because everyone has this law written in their heart where they don't want to kill another human being. Yeah. Right? So my mom had all these books that had very graphic depictions of what an abortion was. And all I had to do was show these two girls, like, hey, this is what you're for? Oh, we're not for that. Exactly. It's violent. There is no more definition of violence. If you see an abortion on an ultrasound, the baby is literally trying to escape. There is no other definition, no better definition of straight up violence than abortion. 54 million folks. It's, everyone's desensitized to it. Most, most Christians don't even think about it anymore. They don't even think about this that's going on in this country. We're going to pay for this, for sure. It's coming. Judgment is coming for this. Look, it's desensitization. This is why, you know, sex sells and more sex sells better after people get desensitized to it. This is why violence sells and when people get desensitized to it, more violence sells better. Here's another thing I read. They, they said this movie, It Chapter 2, is literally going to be the bloodiest movie ever made. They have to up it because people are getting desensitized to it. If they had have thrown something like this out 30 years ago, people would have been like, whoa, that's crazy. But now people need it. You see? That's where we're at. A biblical worldview would destroy the demand for this. It's the worldview. It's, it's the worldview. Hollywood doesn't care. They're driven by avarice. They're driven by just unchecked greed. They're driven by whatever sells. They don't care. They don't care if they destroy your family. They don't care about any of that. More money. That's what they want to make. You say, oh, we just watch cartoons. Disney really doesn't care. There's a statistic like 15 years ago that 40% of the Disney organization are sodomites. Disney has been promoting the sodomite agenda in this country for 30 years. And they're winning. They're driven by hatred of God and greed. In conclusion on TV, let me just say this. I don't want to preach for an hour and a half. Yeah, but some stuff on TV is okay. You know, we pick out the shows. Um, I had a pastor of my last church. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I guess I'm going to. Home and Garden TV. They have a TV in their house, and they just, they just watch HGTV. I went out last night, and I planned to do this, but I went last night, and I picked some of the, 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 what do you call it, the channels that people think are okay. And I decided that the night before the sermon, I was just going to look up what the schedule is on these channels, because I don't know. I'm just going to go to these websites of these channels, pick out what the, the, ne the programming is, or today, or tomorrow, or whatever it was that popped up, and I'm going to report that to you. 
Home and Garden TV, House Hunters with Elliot Gazer, Sodomite. Discovery Channel, looked at the schedule last night, Naked and Afraid. I don't know, a bunch of naked people, I guess. The History Channel, though, that's okay. The History Channel. Ancient Aliens, Aliens and the Creation of Man. And it must have been like a marathon of this Ancient Aliens show because it was like forged by the gods, Ancient Aliens. Here's something I knew about discovery and history 15 years ago before I was even saved. I hated them both. And you know why? You check out those two channels before Easter every single year. Check them out. You go to the website before Easter, they will be driving the, the attacks on Jesus Christ every single year. Before what? Before the most important celebration that the Bible has, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They, they are the ones pushing the Da Vinci Code garbage, uh, the, the gospel of whatever yeah. it is. There's going to be a new gospel every five years. Just get ready for it. They're the ones. It's the History Channel. It's the Discovery Channel. They're worse because they claim to be holding a banner of truth. You see? It's history. It's nature. No, but it's the worldview. It's the worldview. It's wrong. You show me the TV programming that is created by a King James Bible-believing Christian. You show me where that show is. You're not going to find it. It's all bad. It's a Trojan horse, and it's in. And it's in deep. Wait, you know, we got, we got to wake up to this. Amen. And you know what? I can see this with retired people that it, it, it change, when they just, all they do is watch history, Discovery, and Fox News. I can see it. It changes who they are. I'm just like, I'll be talking to these people, and I'm just like, what? Mars and a pyramid with a monkey? What? You know, what are you talking about? I'm not joking. What, oh yeah, the, you know, a billion years ago, aliens came here and they, 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 sh they have a monkey, and I don't even, I, I don't know. But it's, it's, you can see it. It's changing who they are. It's programming them. Internet, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Let's see what God says. The internet. I should have made this one a separate sermon. I apologize up front. Because this is... This deserves it. Amen. We'll be talking about this more in this church. I guarantee it. <clears throat> what does God say? Turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. The Bible says this. The Bible says, But I say unto you... You, you, you guys turn there. I'll read Job 31. I'll give you some more time. Job 31 says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? That's Job. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you, that whosoever look on, look on, looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, there's, the internet is a powerful tool. I believe that when the Bible in the book of Daniel says that in, you know, in the last days, Daniel says that knowledge shall greatly increase, I believe that he is talking about the internet there. I, I can't see how it's not the internet. When we have at our fingertips, the average man or woman today has at their fingertips the knowledge of anything you could possibly want to know. That's a great increase of knowledge. I can find out anything. But it comes with a heavy price. It comes with a heavy price. Let me give you some statistics. In 2018, 91% of teens use smartphones. Most people in general, adults and teens, check their phone 150 times a day. Turn to Sol Song of Solomon. Send to your Bible, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Pornography. 58% of teens have seen online pornography by the time that they're teenagers. 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about pornography with their friends. I have seen this happen over the last 10 years. In work environments, it's not something people are ashamed of anymore. 
You will see men talking amongst themselves about pornography as it's something that's normal. And you don't be part of those conversations. You don't even be with any earshot of those conversations if that's going on at work. And you establish yourself that way. And here's the thing. 64% of American men regularly view pornography. There's no difference across Christian lines. And I understand, I understand that Christian doesn't mean save people. I understand that. But you know what this tells me? This tells me that there's probably several people in this room who have this problem. And that's scary. The odds are for it. The odds are there. Now, pornography will change you in ways that you don't want to be changed, men. Look at Song of Solomon, chapter 7. Here we see a man talking about his wife. And I want you to notice, if you think that this is graphic language, we're going to read it because it's in the Bible. And this is how this man feels about his wife, the woman that he is married to. The Bible says in verse number 1, How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter! The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like young roes that are twins. Thy neck is a tower of ivory, thine eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bathribam. Thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. Thine head upon thee is like caramel, and the hair on thy head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delights. This man has a great affection for his wife, the woman that he is married to. And, you know, another thing that came up over and over again when I was reading about this this week is that, and it's true, it will rob you of the affection for your wife. This pornography. It will rob you of the affection for your wife, and it will rob your wife of your affection. In first, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in the New Testament. You do not have the right to steal from your wife, the Bible says. And it's even worse because you're the leader of your wife. And there's nothing she can do if she is in this type of situation. Because you are, are in charge. It, it must be a horrible situation for a wife to be in. Terrible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 4, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not, not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. You are defrauding your wife if you are looking at these things on the internet. You are committing, you're not only committing adultery in your heart, but you are defrauding your wife. You are stealing from her. I mean, look, nothing will make me see red. I mean, it's happened like once or twice, and nothing will make me see red if I think that somebody is hurting or trying to hurt my wife or my daughter. I will snap like you've never seen me snap before. Amen. And that's the way you should be as a husband. Right. Imagine if you were perpetrating this type of crime against your own wife. It's crazy. Right. Right. I mean, you must not believe the Bible. Now, let me give you a little bit of insight into myself and who I am and my view on addiction as a disease. Okay? I want to show you my view on addiction. And I polled my entire family to make sure. I've read the Bible several times, and I polled my entire family to make sure I wasn't missing something here. Turn to Proverbs 23. I looked for addiction in the Bible. Turn to Proverbs 23. And verse number 29 is where we're going to start. We'll read it together. Proverbs 23 and verse number 29. This is talking about somebody who's a drunk, okay? And I understand that's not the specific um, application that we're talking about here, but it's talking about a drunk. And the Bible says in verse number 29, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? 
Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, and go and seek mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red, and giveth it color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. He said, I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. It just says he's going to go seek it again. In Proverbs 26, in verse 11, turn a couple verses back, or a couple chapters back, and look at Proverbs 26. We're looking for addiction here. We're looking for this disease of addiction in the Bible. In Proverbs 26, 11, the Bible says, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Does that say somebody that's sick returns to their folly? No, it says if you keep doing it again and again and again, turn to Romans 7, that you're a fool. You're not sick, you're a fool. That's what it says. This disease of addiction is a secular invention. And I'm not saying that if you go do drugs that it's, your body's not going to crave that. It is not a disease. It is a secular invention and you're foolish. And I'm going to tell you as a saved person what the Bible says about this. In Romans chapter 7, look at verse number 12. We're going to read down to verse 18. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Okay, so we're not supposed to let sin reign in our body, but what if I can't help it? Keep reading. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Sin should not have dominion over you. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. And here it is, right here. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. You have the ability, if you're saved, to overcome any sin in your life. So you want to know what to do about this pornography, and all this stuff that you're into that you shouldn't be into, what you need to do is you need to stop Amen. today. And you can. Amen. You can stop now. That's the beauty of having a drinking problem, is if you quit drinking, you no longer have a problem. Amen. It's like that. It's easy. Because you're not a slave to it anymore. You care about your wife and your marriage and your children, you will stop. Now. Not next week. You will stop now. Period. Look, I, I gave you a G-rated version of all these stats today. Okay? Because I, you know, it's tough preaching on things like this because you gotta know what's I don't I don't want to defile any kids' ears. I don't want to talk about you, but we got to say something. You know? YouTube. I struggle with YouTube. What I mean by that is I struggle. I mean, Garrett and I have had so many conversations about this. There's so much bad on YouTube. But there's so much good there, too, that can be done. Many people were saved through YouTube, through preaching through YouTube. One of the things I hate about YouTube, and I'm going to get into some details on this when we talk about the application and solutions, it's one of the hardest things to control as far as what content pops up or what's there. It, it's one of the, I mean, I've, I believe I've figured it out, but it's, it was the most difficult thing because it seems harmless to a lot of people, but it is not. There is a lot of garbage on YouTube. And I'm not talking about just waste of time stuff. I'm talking about down the roads of pornography stuff on YouTube. I mean, they're after you to get you to click on things. You have to be smart about these things. We'll get to that. 
A lot of the reasons people believe stupid things is because of YouTube. From giants to stupid flat earth, I didn't, you know, what in the world? I mean, I, didn't, I learned about that three years ago. It's real, you know? It's people wasting time on the internet. So if you're taking TV and you're like, I threw my TV out and all you do is sit around and watch the stupid stuff or putting your kids in front of YouTube all day, what's the difference? Oh, all you watch is preaching. Okay. Sure. Look, it's hard to control. Let's get into some applications today. So we saw, I hope I got across some dangers of, of TV and the internet. What in the world do we do about it? You know, there's a reason we read 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. Did you keep a bookmark there? It's one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. 2 Kings chapter 23. <clears throat> Josiah. I mean, he, he knew how to set things straight. TV. Here's my opinion of TV. You need to go Josiah on that thing. There's nothing good there. Nothing. There's no good thing on TV. Look at 2, uh, 2 Kings 23, chapter si or in verse number 6. Let's look at Josiah. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem onto the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. He burned it, and then he crushed it to powder. It was something that was bad, that was in the temple, and that people were worshiping. And he stamped it to powder, and then he threw the powder over the graves of the people that had worshipped in that thing. And he broke down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. He broke down their houses, and you're going to let them into your house? It's the opposite. He broke their houses down. He killed the false priests, the idolatrous priests. He put them down. That didn't mean he laid them down in a bed. He put them down. He killed them. You're going to let these things, these people, into your home? They're going to let, you let them influence your kids? Verse number 12. And the altars that were on the top of the chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down. And he broke them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kindern. So, there's nothing good there with the TV. Get rid of it. You say, oh, but sports. Sports is fine. And people watch a lot of sports. I can't believe it, almost. It's It's crazy. I, I was eight years old, eight or nine years old, and you know what I still remember? There was a Thanksgiving football game on, and I still remember adult relatives of mine making comments on the cheerleaders in the game. I'm 42 years old right now, and I remember that like it was yesterday. You're going to sit around with your wife and your daughters dressed like ladies and living for the Lord, and you're going to watch that garbage? Okay, say you're never going to change. You're going to be who you are. You're just going to be a dirtbag your whole life. What about your kids? I still remember that. I think it was probably the first time I had heard it, which is why it was so shocking to me at the time. Because I probably got used to it, right? Probably got desensitized to it. Your kids are watching you. How many times have I said that in the last couple weeks during this series? The internet, turn to Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> There's a lot of powerful things on the internet. The internet's a, a, a crazy tool. Like I said, every single piece of information you could ever want to know is on the internet. But let me just say this about the internet. If you can't control the internet, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Disconnect from it. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 29. And this is what Jesus is getting at here. Is everyone there? Matthew 5, 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is, prof it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. 
And Jesus is just giving uh, a theory here, an analogy here, that if you have a problem with something and it, you know, it benefits you and there's, you know, the internet benefits me and how could I ever be without the internet? If you cannot get over this problem or you have a problem in your home or you can't get complete control of it in your home, get rid of it. It would be better to not have it. It would be better to never have email or never have the news or never have all those good things or whatever than to have this problem along with those good things. That is what Jesus is getting at here. So if you can't control it, get rid of it. Now, you want to know my method on the internet? I'm going to give you my method. Some guys were talking yesterday about methods. I didn't say anything because I'm going to give you mine right now. I have no filters in my home on the internet. None. You know why? Because filters can be gotten around. I, have, I monitor everything. There's no filters. Anybody in my house could go up to the computer that's in my living room in an open area of my house. By the way, did you guys notice yesterday where my computer is? Is it off in a closet somewhere? It's in an open area of the house. There's specific rules on phones and where those phones will be placed in the house at all times. There will never be a phone in a bedroom in my house. There's specific, you want to use the phone? A kid wants to use the phone, they will be sitting in a certain spot and that phone will be on a certain table, right there. And I monitor everything. There is nothing that goes across a computer or a phone in my house that my wife doesn't have access to and doesn't check regularly. You understand? Get rid of your iPhone because it can't be monitored. Because it's proprietary software. Guy's a sodomite anyway. Get rid of it. You can't get into it. The Apple iOS can't be broken into by third-party software. Android software can. You want to get technical? Let's get technical. And you know what? Here's another reason. Do you think that my sons are going to live with me for the rest of their life? They need to understand how to use this tool responsibly. They need to understand how to handle this thing that could destroy their life or the life of their wife or their entire family. They need to understand, and I have this talk all the time. Garrett probably thinks I'm crazy, but I talk to him all the time about this stuff. Because you could destroy your life. And you wonder, you know, why are you so upset about this? You know why? Because I read those statistics and I got a daughter that's going to marry somebody someday. Are you kidding me? I got a daughter that's going to get married one day, and if I look at these statistics, the odds are against her, but you better believe I'm going to even that score. Amen. You better believe I'm going to vet that situation like you've never... She's probably going to be so irritated with me. But you wait. Because it matters, the parents, of who that boy is that she marries. Because I want to know how they did things. Because she marries somebody with a problem like this, it's a life sentence, my friends. You want to talk about getting pierced through with many sorrows. That'd be a sad day. Look, you need to learn to control these things and be aware of these Trojan horses in your house. You know, you got to destroy these altars. You got to get rid of this TV. I don't know what to tell you. You know? I talked a, a couple weeks ago about you know, how I'm not here to follow you home. You know, I'm not here to follow you home. And you know what? Here's why I don't have to. Because when you think, ah, it's just a game, <clears throat> I'm not going to deal with those consequences you are. And when you think, ah, it's just a TV show, there's nothing on that TV show, I'm not going to bear those consequences. You are. You know, when you think, ah, you know, he's not doing anything wrong with that phone in his room. We trust him. He's a good kid. I'm not going to bear those consequences. You are. And some poor girl that marries him is going to deal with those consequences. So that's why I don't have to follow you home. You either listen or you're going to bear those consequences. And you know what? These things are appealing. They're alluring. There's a reason the Bible said that it will cleave, that it cleave not to me. 
Because those things, they're, they seem fun. And they seem pleasurable. And they seem, you know, appealing. But they will cleave. And they will enslave you. And they, they will very quite possibly ruin your life or the life of some other family. So this stuff is no joke. You know, you'll pay a heavy price and, you know, maybe your kid falls into that wrong crowd. Because people on TV, he was watching, they seem funny and quirky. Maybe your kid, I've seen this happen to somebody in my family. They're funny and quirky people. Then what? You know, those are heavy consequences, my friend. People will burn in hell because of these consequences. You know, I grew up with a kid who everybody loved that fell into these things. He's going to burn in hell because of it. It's sad. There's nothing, I mean, I'm not getting it across. Turn to Matthew 12. <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with one final thought. Matthew chapter 12. You say, Josiah, Josiah seemed a little extreme here. They found the book of the law, and the guy just went, I mean, he went crazy. And he cleaned house. In Matthew 12, verse 30, the Bible says, Jesus says this, He that is not with me is against me. What about the gray area, people? What about the people who are in that gray zone? They're against him. That's the way Jesus talked in these extreme, this extreme language all the time. The gray area, you're against me, is what he meant. He that is not with me is against me. You know, Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? You know, I want to know when you read these statistics, who's on the Lord's side? Josiah he burned the altars, he smashed them into powders, and then he took the bones of the false prophets and he burned them too. He went crazy. He drove like Jehu. That's why they saw him coming. He drives like Jehu. Those are the men that did great things for God in the Bible. They went all the way to get it right. And I hope that you men here today, if you're not like this now, I hope you get like this. Because you need to be on the Lord's side because everybody's after you. This world is after you, and they're after the walls of your home, and they're after your kids. Who is on the Lord's side? you got to get extreme. Forget what the world says. you got to go Josiah on this thing. You understand? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the men in the Bible. There were such great examples for us. We thank you for the words of Jesus in the Bible. Lord, we, we ask that you, through a wicked world, that you, you show us the examples of these men in the Bible and you wake us up. And you get us to realize that this is real, this fight is there. It's against us. We don't want to be in a fight and not know we're in a fight, Lord. Thank you for your word. We thank you for these people in this church. God bless these families in this church, Lord. I pray that you strengthen the men in this church. Lord, I ask you to bless today. Bless the soul winning. Bless Brother Oliver's trip here. And bless church this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.